girl, real talk. This whole, it's a new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. You can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, streaming January 25th, only on Netflix. A note to listeners. The following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Discretion is advised. Upon calling police, we ran out there, and when police met us, the first thing that was said was, well, she probably had a fight with her boyfriend, she'll be back, and they left. And I will tell you, in any missing person's case, that's when you lose. You start to lose there immediately, because obviously the first couple hours and then the first 24 hours are the most important. From that point, it was, it was very difficult to even try and get someone out to look for Jennifer. You get a lawyer involved and then you start approaching the attorney general and the governor and say, something's wrong here. You need to start talking to your people. What's going on? And, you know, that and a little media, it's a lot of stuff, but you have to be willing to take what's going to come back to you. We wanted to bring you up to date on something we were recently made aware of that's happening with one of the law enforcement agencies that investigated Molly and Colt's case, the Carter County Sheriff's Department. An attorney, Jason D. May, who was based in Ardmore, Oklahoma, put out a statement saying that a secret recording device was found in the attorney room of the jail. For the local people in that area, it's been all over the news there. But for the rest of our audience, if this is true, this is just another example of some of the corruption that takes place in Carter and Love County. Attorney Jason Day was quoted as saying, The bugging of an attorney room is a clear violation of the Fifth and Sixth Amendments to the United States Constitution. We have a call into his office to find out more details. According to the news articles in the local press, the Carter County Sheriff, Chris Bryant, who we interviewed in 2018 for the documentary about Molly and Cold, said the device has been there since 2002 and was placed there by former Carter County Sheriff Harvey Burkhardt, who happens to be Bryant's ex-father-in-law and is deceased. In a statement to the press, Sheriff Bryant acknowledges that the device was found in the attorney room, but according to him... The device appeared to be antiquated and not in working condition. Sheriff Bryant apparently removed the recording device, which was hidden in the ceiling and a lighting fixture, and gave it to the OSBI. Now to move on to today's podcast. Around the same time that we met Paula Fielder and learned about Molly and Colt's case, we also met Drew Kessie. Drew is the father of Jennifer Kessie. Jennifer mysteriously disappeared in 2006 from Orlando, Florida, after returning home from an island vacation. Drew, like Paula, was dismissed by law enforcement in the crucial first moments of the investigation, and he has been battling the Orlando Police Department in order to get answers to what happened to his beautiful 24-year-old daughter, Jennifer, who has been missing for 16 years. We feel it's important to hear from others who have had similar experiences navigating the police, the politics, and dealing with crimes like these when they are trying to recover a loved one. The Kessie case is so outrageously upsetting, it has haunted us. We consider Drew a friend, and we are very grateful to have him on today. We have Drew Kessie on the phone with us. And to give you a little background on Drew, his daughter went missing in 2006, Jennifer Kessie. And we met we met Drew when we were doing Up and Vanished, actually, the same time that we were doing Paula and Molly and Colt's story. We got to know Drew very well about this case, and there was a lot of similar qualities to the case that he's dealing with, still dealing with, the pending case of his missing daughter, who would be, what, 40 today, Drew? Around Correct, this? yes. So yes. it's been 16 years of Drew and his family trying to investigate what happened to his daughter. We really appreciate you being on today and to kind of give us a little bit more context of what a family members go through during these protracted periods of no answers and how 
law enforcement not necessarily as as hard as they might try sometimes they don't do the best job investigating these cases so i think the parallels between your daughter's case and molly and colt there's a lot of similar qualities and so let's start off with why don't you just tell the audience just kind of give them a brief thumbnail about your beautiful daughter and her story and and kind of bring us up to date on where <clears throat> what's happening right now sure jennifer was a young adult she was 24 when she was taken and we truly believe she was taken but she had just gone on a long weekend vacation down to the islands with her boyfriend they came back they lived about three hours apart he in south florida she in central florida and they were getting very close to each other and having conversations about who was going to leave their job to move to the other and move it on up to the next level. But they had gone away for four days. They had both gone home to their homes. Jennifer had gone right to work and came home that night and spoke to her old friends, family, everyone, everything was great. And the next morning, about 10.30 in the morning, I got a call from a friend. She did work at a company that a friend of mine works at and said, hey, uh, Jennifer didn't show up from work. Is everything okay? And I said, well, yeah, everything's fine. Let me give her a call. And for the first time since she was 15, when we gave her a phone, when she got her license, it went directly into voicemail. Didn't ring three times or what have you. It went directly into voicemail never never that never happened to us before from that second on we knew something was very wrong with jennifer and we immediately we were two hours away from her where she lived in orlando we took off to the roads calling jails hospitals trying to find jennifer her friends everything upon calling police we ran out there and when police met us the first thing that was said was well she probably had a fight with her boyfriend she'll be back and they left and i will tell you in any missing person's case that's when you lose you start to lose there immediately because obviously the first couple hours and then the first 24 hours are the most important from that point it was it was very difficult to even try and get someone out to look for jennifer but here nor there over 16 years we have tried and there's been a lot of folks involved just as in this case fbi has been involved mbi which is a, an orlando metropolitan police have been involved florida department of law enforcement a, a lot of different agencies it just came down to nothing was happening in the case period and after 10 years we we asked for the files to the case and they refused law enforcement said no we're just not giving you files so we said we're going to sue you for the files we want to see what is there we think we can find our daughter so we're told it's one of the first or second times in america that an open active case we actually it was an out of court contract but we actually won the right to get all of jennifer's sixteen thousand pages of her files and it cost us a lot of money it costs around sixty seventy thousand dollars courts and everything else to get our hands on that and it was just a farce when we got our hands on it it was just unbelievable but uh, we understand you know the, the fighting you go through with law enforcement with legal everything it's just it shouldn't happen obviously but we did end up getting the records we were successful in suing the department and from that point on then we have direction we had a staff we have a staff of um, retired investigators from across the country that help us and they have delved into it and our next step was well we need to get the whole investigation out of Orlando if they just don't want to work on it or they don't know how to work on it. And that's the biggest problem. You can't hold a lot of these things against some local and even city departments because when you have a long-term missing per person, it takes experience and it takes it, it just takes a different type of person. And that's why I've been pushing for, you know, on a national basis, regional missing person centers for the long term missing persons so you have specialty people in doing all this mm -hmm. and also you know reading in this case too the family kind of wants to get it out of cold case and i have to be honest with you that's exactly where you want the case is in cold case for a few reasons there's much more money there they're more experienced to do what needs to be done on a missing persons case and all of their tentacles are just so much better than just a, a, a detective squad in, in a city. So you have to look at, you know, the good and bad of that. But you also have to look at, we're, we're very pro-law enforcement, our family. Uh, we've had man, family members that are first responders in law enforcement and everything else. But in any given occupation, it's the old 80-20. You know, 80% of the people are great. 20% of the people don't know what they're doing. Or in your way, for one reason or another. And you have to get over that. And 
you have to be loud. You have to let people know that it's, it's a human being, number one, that we're talking about. We're not talking about a car, money, property. It's a human being. And we're going to do the right thing, period, end of discussion. And you're not going to go away. So get it through your heads. We're going to get this done properly. And I'm here to tell you it's the hardest thing on earth. I pound my head against the wall every single day for almost 17 years. But slowly but surely, we are getting to where we need. And we are going to move the case out of Orlando. We're in the middle of that. So we're, we're, it just takes time because it's government. Mm -hmm. And politics does come in, in, into play. And it's horrible that politics comes into play. But it is. And I never thought it would come into play. But I would be in the AG's office, the Attorney General's office and I would be in the governor's office. We went from the top down. As soon as we weren't getting any success at, at the level, local level, we just said, no, we're just, we're not fooling with people. We're going right to the top, but we're very active. We passed three laws in the state of Florida. I was asked by the governor at the time to, to actually be the first president of Florida Missing Children's Day Foundation in the, in the state of Florida, which is under the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So we're, we're we gave up our lives and we to this day we give up our lives for jennifer period and you have to be willing to do that as a family member and basically we've lost everything our jobs our home our money our friends part of the family you just but to me it doesn't matter because i'm gonna find my daughter i created her from love she is family and i just won't have it any other way but that's jennifer's story yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an amazing story, and it's you, a heartbreaking story, and, and 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 always has been since the minute that we met you, and it's always stayed with us. Um, we've never stopped thinking about you guys and and Jennifer because it is a really heartbreaking story that these things happen in the United States, and that you had to go through what you had to go through in order to get any answers about what happened to your beautiful young daughter. As you say, it is a human being, and I think that that's where people seem to forget because with Molly. Paula has been doing similar to what you've been doing, and she kind of reminds us of you a little bit in her determination and grit to get answers. And she's been thwarted every step of the way and being told that she's impeding the investigation or she's the problem. And yeah. it's, I think that's awful. I mean, I know you've experienced that. How do you deal with that, Drew? Well, it took me to almost 13 years before I went to look for legal help. I probably should have gotten legal help sooner. Get into court, press your, put your story in court, get it in front of a judge. Because if, if, you know, truth doesn't lie, that's all there is to it. And if the facts are behind you, as they are in Jennifer's case, present those facts, can't get around it. So force, force the courts, force the issue, mm. get them into court. They might all of a sudden, you know, our guys didn't believe Orlando Police Department did not believe we were going to sue them. For a year, I said, I'm, I'm going to get you in court. Like, don't you just want to sit down and work this out? We don't need to do this stupidly. And they said, no, no, no. Um, and I told them, I'm like, before I, I file, are you sure? No, go away, Drew. Boom. So you have to you have to push it. You don't want to do it. That's the last thing I want to do. It's the first time I've ever been in court in my life, but I had to do it. Yeah. yeah. So you have to do what you have to do. If you don't have legal representation, you know, and we're very lucky. We have a, a team of investigators and a legal team who is working for free. And, and I can't even tell you, if I had to pay for it, we'd be, nowhere. We'd be done, period. Because that's all they've done anyhow is let's string it out. Let's string it out until you get lawyers involved. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, you get a lawyer involved and then you start approaching the attorney general and the governor and say, something's wrong here. You need to start talking to your people. What's going on? And, you know, that and a little media, it's a lot of stuff, but you have to be willing to take what's going to come back to you. Yeah. Let, let's talk uh, about a little bit how you how you handled the media because you, you, you did it in a really smart way. I mean, you just... Kind of tell us what, what your what your plan was and what and you instinctively knew that's what you had to do. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Well, first, first I, I have to say that I, you know I'm I'm a I'm in marketing and sales as a career. I was at least. Um, so I had the ability to communicate, and I think I do have the ability to communicate, which is important. You have to be able to speak to people, and you have to be able to get your ideas uh, across to people. But 
you have to reach out to the media. We were very lucky. Uh, you know, there's just weird stuff that happened right up front. And Jennifer's case was taken in by the media from the first day on. But then it's up to you to keep it going. You know, it could fall off very quickly. And it, it's amazing the way media works. I know how it all works now. <laughs> you know, I've been told for in a very, you know, maybe year th five through seven, I was still contacting, please, let's do something for Jenna, please. And I'm like, well, we got to have something new, Jim. We have to have something new. You know, it has to be glamorous. Mm -hmm. I stopped calling and now all I do is get calls, period. But y you have to put yourself out there. And you have to you have to make their loved ones real and you have to let everyone know that they're real i mean i've sat and said i don't care if my daughter is a crack whore which she isn't no one deserves not to be found and to this day that's the that's the biggest gripe i have is no one deserves not to be found in this country period Exactly. And that's the biggest problem we're having with Molly because she was uh, using drugs and drugs were in heavily, heavily involved in this case. But she was a 17 year old girl. And I have to keep reminding everyone she was 17 years old. She's a child. You're you're talking about her like she's some crazy crack, you know, crackhead. Who cares? None of that's it relevant. Doesn't it doesn't matter. And she's Chickasaw. It, it, so she's indigenous. That's another issue the media has a problem with. So yeah. it's it's been very frustrating for Paula and her and and her quest in trying to get media attention until we came into her her life it was very hard for her to get anything except basic local news like we went to Nancy you know she went to Nancy Gra they wanted Nancy Grace didn't happen and you wonder why like why is this story different than another story like Gabby Petito who was lost and found within a week I mean yeah I I, I can't I can't you know I can't tell you that, but people will come right out and say, honestly, blonde, blue eyed, white women, period. Yeah, it's a shame. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. And when people say that, you know what I say? Seems that that's what people want, huh? Mm. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And didn't really know the background of, of, the, of the young woman, but it doesn't matter what they are. How, how can, how, if there's someone's child, Okay, and let me tell you what we did in here in Florida through the Jennifer Kessie Tiffany Sessions Missing Persons Act of 2008. Two sentences in that act gave Florida the right to the silver alert, which is for elderly people with dementia or, you know, someone with a disability that goes missing. You see the, the highway signs. Okay, we've recovered every single person. And while I was passing that, trying to pass that law, it is the fact that I don't care if your, your grandmother or grandfather's 92 years old. My God, it's a person. But if you're under 18, you have the CIA, the FBI, every single three letter department that can help you find your child. I had to beg for the FBI. It took me four years for the FBI and it turned out to be the worst experience of my life. So you gotta wait, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a whole strange world. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what you're gonna get every single time you walk into a room. You don't know what you're gonna get. And sometimes you just have to blow up and make people realize what is going on, period. And it's hard, I mean, you know, they can come back at you. They have power. I don't worry about that. They can come back at me for anything. I have nothing. <laughs> so come on, swap me. Who can? What are you going to do to me? Yeah, you're 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 their worst enemy. You're a man with nothing to lose. Well, it, yeah, I, and that's the thing. You know, the the most dangerous person on earth is the, that one who has nothing more to lose. Well, I'm there. So, and you have to be able to do anything, and it doesn't matter. You know, my life. Oh, I hate this. My life doesn't matter anymore in a way. Jennifer's does. And if I have to give my life up to get to that, I'm willing to do that. A lot of people around me have said, you're pretty damn stupid. I don't think so. Because I created Jennifer out of love and I'll never stop until I find her or I die, period. Why would they say you're stupid? Who says that? Uh, people think that, you know, Drew, you're ruining your life. You've lost everything. Why do you continue to go on? You know, just give it up. She's not coming back. Uh, can't do that. Sorry. Can't do that. How could you do that? Well, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how anyone could do that. I can't imagine going through what you and um, 
Paula and other people in that position. I mean, it's heart wrenching to watch. I can't even imagine being in those shoes and to be so well, callous to say, move on. It's well, your child. Well, I think what's also interesting is both you and Paula have the same experience of being attacked because you're being an advocate for your family member. When anybody who was put in that situation, we've put this question to a lot of people that we've talked to on the podcast, law enforcement, attorneys and everything. And they all said the same thing. I would do anything, anything to get them back. And that within, you know, even outside the law, I'd be like hunting down people. Absolutely. I'd be, I'd be, you know, going on people's property, trespassing. I would do anything to find the answers to my missing loved one. The only thing you don't do is lie. Because if you're caught in a lie, everything goes away, period. Everyone goes away, everything goes away. Oh, yeah, no, everything has to be transparent. So, and Paula and I have yeah. talked about that from day one. She's like, yeah. I, she doesn't lie about anything. She'll tell you straight yeah. up every single detail. And that's it. It's like, this is the truth on the table. And I'm not anyone lied. Yeah. No, I mean, no, no, no. I know. Truth, truth rules, period. But it's true because if you don't put all the truth out there, because law enforcement right. is not putting the truth out there. And we're in a different situation with this case because there's so much corruption in this area. Yeah. The sheriff was arrested. That's why I would, I would just be going right, right to the governor. Yeah. And at this point, it, it's I think Paula has reached out to the AG and she's and there's people yeah. have been speaking to government officials in her behalf. And but, you know, they're their hands are tied as well. And sure. the OSBI, who apparently is leading the investigation like that, I mean, they, they're they looking into it more now. And I feel like there's a there's definitely a, a groundswell of investigation that's happening. And I think hopefully there'll be some movement and some answers soon. But it took almost 10 years for them to do that. Because Paula, unlike you, didn't really push the envelope with the press as much as you did in the beginning. You did it right from the get-go. She she waited and she would filter information that people would give to her. I mean, the biggest thing she did was she created a Facebook page, and then they she got attacked for that because she felt they said that she was she was obstructing the investigation when all she was doing was was providing a a place a memorial for Molly so people can go there and talk about it, and if they had information about the case, they can kind of. They can every, give it. Every missing person has a Facebook page and should. Exactly. Every, yeah. 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 And, but, but that's what you're up. That's what you're up against, though. I mean, and, and you have to, and you have to stand up to that because all you. And honestly, I mean, it's simple stuff, though. I've I've looked at I don't know how many people in the eye and said, "What would you be doing for your daughter?" And it changes the whole scene. I mean, you can't go against that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I wanted this now because of. What would you be doing if we did this, this? I mean, let's look at us. Everybody thinks that, you know, okay, we, we've been successful in doing things here, there, and everywhere. We just got out of court, okay? It took us four years on a four-month contract to get all of Jennifer's files. Four years. Because they just kept sending us, oh, we found more. Oh, we found more. Then we found out, and we found out in writing, that no one has worked Jennifer's case in the last 10 years. Mm. So if we didn't take them to court, and get the records, they would still be telling us that they're working Jennifer's case, where they haven't worked it in 10 years. So it, it, you have to keep people's feet to the fire, period. They're human beings. Some of them just don't even like their jobs. Some of them don't care once they go home, things like that. So it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's hard, <laughs> but you have to persevere and you have to be strong and you have to say, no, it's because of my loved one. And I'm not going to give up no matter what. Some are stronger, some aren't. I'm just, you know, sometimes I say, well, I'm just stupid in the head. So I keep going. Yeah. But, well, I mean, know. Paula did the same thing. She felt like she didn't put the pedal to the metal and because and she was she was playing nice. Any information she got, because people were coming to her with evidence. Right. They were true. coming with stuff. And she would, first thing she would do, she, some of the evidence she gave to, back to the corrupt sheriff's department because right. she didn't know they were corrupt at the time. And, you know, that, that evidence years. got lost or... They just kind of, things happened. Some stuff made it to the OSBI, but there was no follow-up. There was no communication. Oh, yet they would say, yeah, this is, I don't even know, know if they said it was a cold case. They were still treating it as a missing person. No, they were case. saying that it was a runaway case from the beginning. Well, I know, that but was then the they, problem. Yeah. And so the media even ran with that story that it was a runaway case. So they didn't get any media from the, from the get-go. It took a long time. But yeah. I, I was curious about, she's had agents tell her to get the files, to get the files, to get the files, get the files. No, she's going to have to, you, you're going to have to go totally, you, you file suit. Girl, real talk. 
this whole it's a new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. You can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. Join me, 48 Hours correspondent Erin Moriarty, on my podcast, My Life of Crime, as I take on true crime investigations like no other. This season, I'm looking into the labyrinth of crime and secrets within families. I'm cutting straight to the evidence and talking to the people directly involved, including investigators and the families of victims. Listen to My Life of Crime with Erin Moriarty wherever you get your podcasts. Just file suit. Instead of doing a FOIA request, you just file a lawsuit. No, you won't get you won't get the whole file on a FOIA request. It's, it's a nine year old file, right? Yeah. So it's pretty extensive. They're going to make you pay for it. Okay. It costs it costs us sixteen thousand dollars just to duplicate our file. I know we mentioned that in the podcast. That when you told me that, I was just kind of yeah for yeah okay. just for copy. You can get a FOIA, yeah, you can get a FOIA request for a file within that file. You can get that. You can't get the whole file. They just say, you, you got to go to court, period, period. Force them to give you a copy of that file, unredacted, because they're going to have to redact names and social security numbers and things like NCIC information anyhow, unredacted. Otherwise, they'll give you a file and they'll give it all, all redacted like they did to us. Yeah, I remember that. You showed us that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. re- did you did you get stuff unredacted yet? Yeah, we got it totally unredacted okay, cool. because we threw it back in their face and the judge and said, you know, what are you trying to pull? They said, oh, we started doing it before we were ordered to actually do it unredacted. I'm saying, well, now you got to do yourself double work, you idiot. You know, it, it's all, you know, it's people you're dealing with. <laughs> it's, some are really good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some aren't. Is it the mentality? Is it just covering up for their inadequacies in the investigation? Or is it just the, the slow moving bureaucratic bullshit that government sometimes does it's a it's both but government let me tell you government moves so slow it's you know what you think would be a day is a month period yeah so it's just it's just that way everybody's covering their ass all along the way and i could tell you story after story after story of political people just trying to cover their asses because they want to stay in power and stay where they are and not have any ruffle feathers of any kind Let's keep everything the same. Everything's working good. It doesn't work that way. You got to ruffle feathers. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. some people's feathers need to be ruffled. ruffled. I mean, I, you know, you can't have crap going on in a city for, you know, 30, 40 years. No. Stick all, stick a fork in it. Let's go. Make a difference. So you did make a difference by passing laws in Jennifer's name. Can you tell us a little bit about those and, and what how that came about? Sure. When Jennifer was taken, there was not one policy or procedure in 2006 for a missing person in the state of Florida. Not one law, not one policy, not one procedure, nothing. So we looked to other states who had missing persons laws and we uh, found one out of Nebraska that fit perfectly. And we went to town and we adapted the language to meet Florida. And Joyce and I used to drive five and a half hours up to Tallahassee to speak three minutes each committee meetings and drive five and a half hours back down you do that about seven to eight times a bill in the in the session and you hope like heck that it gets passed we had the opportunity to do it three times and all three bills that we were able to pass pass through with not even one descending vote uh, so we were able to create what every single law enforcement agency in the state of Florida needs to do in the first two hours, what databases the information has to be put into and the actions they must take. And it clarifies everything. It tells everyone what job they need to do. Then I had mentioned the silver alert, which is just to us is phenomenal. You know, to the people that we're, we're bringing home is incredible. And then we found out we passed a DNA upon felony arrest instead of felony conviction. Because in the state of Florida, before, by the time you are convicted from being arrested for a felony, you commit 5.5 more felonies on the way to being convicted. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to nip it in the butt up front. 
So if you're arrested, we're going to run your DNA and see all the other stuff you did first and try and stop you from doing more. Yeah. And then we have a scholarship at the University of Central Florida in the graduate degree for law enforcement out there, the program that they have out there, because we need better cops. So we give about $1,000 away each semester to just help a graduate student get through and hopefully become a, a better cop, a better detective better investigator. So for um, people that you have to stay out. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think what you guys have done is amazing and a really big testament to what a family can actually accomplish when you're just persistent and you won't take no for an answer. Can you give us a little bit of, I know this is hard to talk about, but I think a lot of people don't really know that much about Jennifer's case. And the, cu- the first couple of days were so detrimental to her case and the fact that there was actual videotape of a perpetrator. Can you just kind of give people a little bit more of a sketch of what happened in those first few days and the evidence that came up? Yeah, sure. As I mentioned, Jennifer was away on vacation. She came back, she went to work and the second day going back to work, she worked all day, came home, talked to us all, didn't make it back to work, which would have been a Tuesday. We immediately, she didn't make a meeting an hour and a half into work. We immediately were on the road. So, you know, whatever happened to Jennifer, we only had an hour and a half that we had to fill in an hour and a half. And to this day, we still can't fill it in. But we, as I said, we, you know, we started running out to Orlando. And when we met our first police officer, he looked around her condo. And she probably had a fight with her boyfriend. She'll be back. And they walked out. And it took us about eight hours to actually get detectives to her condo. We just had to call everyone we knew. And we did have some contacts in the city, in the town. So we used them. And it took us time. But when they came out... You know, we had, once they told us, oh, she had a fight with her boyfriend, an hour later, our family, as well as Jennifer's friends and schoolmates at the university, we're on the streets with flyers. You're not going to do something? We are. We know our daughter. Something happened to our daughter. We cannot locate her. This has never happened, period. So we we took it upon ourselves. And again, it took us about eight hours and we had about 14 people in Jennifer's condo. And when the police came, they said, well, this was a crime scene. You got it all messed up. We can't use it now. And I looked at him, I'm like, what do you do when somebody gets murdered in a bar? I'm like, you have 14 people. They're here. Start taking prints and DNA. Like, what are you talking about? And kick us out of here. No, we don't need anything. And then we find out that they didn't write any anything down. This is just like talking out of school. But, you know, they didn't write anything down and they retired three months later because they said, we don't work with computers. We just keep it up in our minds. Well, they were forced to come back after retirement and write a supplemental on what they did because there's nothing in the case. And that's what one thing law enforcement has to realize you have to document because of long-term cases like Jennifer's. People need to know what happened. I'm the only person in Joyce. It's the only two people that really know what happened over 17 years. So then we go through that, we find Jennifer's car a mile down the street two days later. We have film of a gentleman who sat in the car 32 seconds, wiped it down, got out, walked away, never looked back. And the film is very grainy. It was a 30 year old camera around a pool security camera. And every three seconds, which is a security camera takes film every three seconds, this person's gait and walk was behind, his head was behind a fence post every three seconds. So the film we have, we can't even tell the person. We don't see his face. We can't, you know, it's just the hardest thing on earth to still watch to this day. And then we've just had people, you know, law enforcement after law enforcement, we've had five chiefs, about 20 detectives, just challenges all the way along the way. People just didn't want to do the things that they they needed to do. And then other people that did lost their jobs in the department because what they wanted to do and couldn't do. So it's, it's a mixed bag, but you have to fight through all of it. We, we, at one point, we used to write a weekly letter to our detectives and to the department encouraging them. And we did that for 130 weeks. And they said, please don't stop sending those letters. They actually make us work. <laughs> you know, so it, it, there's just... That's interesting you said that. That's that interesting. Yeah, that's interesting because Paula has had to do the same thing. And like I said before, she played nice with all of the law enforcement and cooperated and give them evidence and tips and give them stuff. And, you know, because mm-hmm. people were giving stuff to her. 
And people were mm-hmm. telling her. It's just unlike... We still get it every day. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and, you know, because it's a very small community. Paula doesn't, didn't even live there. She was brought in by her, Molly's mother. Tough. And yeah. because she was she was a strong individual and she was asked yeah. by Molly's mother, I need your help. And she took this quest and she's taken it just like you, has fought all the way and is continuing to fight and as still gets attacked because of her determination and her grit of not giving up just like you and Joyce. And yeah. it's really kind of a, it's been hard to watch. We've, we've watched both of these cases and we know both of you, both of the families very well. I mean, we, we spent time with you and Joyce and your family and your, it's heartbreaking. And same with Paula. I mean, we, we talk to Paula all the time. Oh, it's awful. And so it's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because Paula has done just like you. She is, she's done all her own searches. She's gotten people and volunteers, you know, professionals and forensic people to volunteer their time to do these searches. Mm -hmm. And the police department doesn't participate, but they show up and they watch. So us too. Exactly. I've had, I've, I've had more searches than the police department have, and they do show up. Exactly. They do watch. Can you talk a little bit about, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but when we were with you, you got a tip with from one of your investigators about mm-hmm. a potential area where of something might have happened at a pond. And yeah. can you talk us through that and tell us what, you alluded to this yesterday, a little bit on our phone call, but I think it's really important for people to hear because it just kind of indicates the mindset sometimes on these cold cases where law enforcement feels obligated to, or forced to look at these things because of people like yourself and Paula, but doesn't really carry it through. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, to, as a family, private, just a private family in an investigation like this, I mean, it, to come forward to police to make them act on anything, you have to have your ducks in a row. I mean, you have to have proof. You have to be, you have to have something solid for them to even lift a finger. And I don't blame them. It, it costs a lot of money to initiate searches. But we had an we had an instance where I think it was actually 13, 14 years in and through the shows that have been on TV and what have you for Jennifer. We had a, a woman call in that said, I guess in year three, she had kept it in for 10 years. She was up at the lake in the Orlando area and out sunbathing and saw someone across the lake pull up in a pickup truck, seem to take a rolled up piece of carpet out, walk it into a lake, drop it, look around, get out and, and drive away. And she kept that in for 10 years. She saw a show, picked it up and gave us a call and said, you know, this might be nothing, but this is my experience. And we had our investigators go out and, you know, we, we vetted her probably six months, just kept going back and this and that, and things just didn't change. So we brought it to the powers to be and we said, well, we want this search and they're like, oh, come on, please. So he said, well, we're gonna search it. And that's when you folks were there. And, you know, we had a private search team come out and we we, we hit. Yeah, two dogs on, hit, on two dogs hit. We had, well, yeah, I'm sorry, we had two dogs hit private, privately. Mm-hmm. And that kind of said, oh, well, and the police were there. They, they showed up, they said, oh, we wanna see what's going on. And they showed up and then they brought in their own teams and they brought in three separate teams of dogs. And I watched it and I noticed that two dogs had hit because I had over the years been educated and actually vetted those teams for the state of Florida in a program that we had to help the state out with missing people. And the police just told, shook their heads, I'm sorry, there was no hits, there was no hits. And it wasn't until literally, that's that's two years ago or three years ago now? Yeah. It wasn't until last week that I found out that two of their dogs actually did hit. You know, so one, one thing you should know also is police are allowed to lie to you you're not allowed to lie to them yeah and it's a shame it's a shame that police do lie in a missing person's case but for whatever reason it's for whatever reason to me what that tactic should be saved for is when they have someone in an interview room and they're interrogating (laughs) them and they're and they're trying to elicit a confession that's what that's supposed to be for not to victims families not to the parents of a beautiful 24 year old girl who's vanished into thin air (laughs) sorry i don't buy that to to me that's ridiculous they shouldn't be lying to the families and the victims families i agree with that but that's just uh, that's the nature of the beast I, I, all of it's infuriating, Drew. It's honestly, as far as like a national missing person center that can just focus on, because I mean, we've been talking about this with a bunch of different people about just having an agency specifically for missing, investigating missing persons cases. Absolutely. How come we don't have that? 
Yeah. And the, the, the stats are 600,000, and you know the stat, 600,000 a year. Of people go missing yeah. and they say like a good probably 30 to 40 percent of it of those people are homicides oh it, there's so much that could be it's it's just incredible how how far it's come i mean when when jennifer went missing in the state of florida we had a hundred a hundred thousand missing persons being called in every year now we're down to about forty thousand being called in because we, we really are finding them quickly a lot of it is runaway and things like that or they get end up being murdered and you know missing we, we find them quickly it's the one to one and a half percent that's that's the abductions the stranger abductions are long term out of that which you say six hundred thousand you do the math on that that's like sixty thousand then right Something like that, mm -hmm. or six thousand. That's six six thousand Americans are just puff in the air, and no one's really looking for them on a long term basis. You don't think our national, our federal government? What's the number one job of the federal government? Safety and well being of its people. Well, Jennifer didn't get that opportunity at the age of twenty four. That that's been taken away from her and us, quite frankly, at this point. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, listen, people like yourself and Paula, unfortunately, are doing the hard work, the excruciatingly hard work because of your experiences. Because I don't think most people understand what family members have to go through in order to get answers. And it's just, that's all you want is answers. It's yeah. like, you want, you, want, you want to find out, you want, you want to know whether or not, I mean, because there is a potential theories that, I mean, could she still be out there? alive we don't know there's nothing i mean because there was nothing right. at the crime scene i mean you know, unlike you know same with with paula and molly and colt i mean there's no bodies there's no yeah. i mean there's explanations and theories and things about what people said and said they saw and stuff like that but it's like the telephone game everything starts to become more like a myth after like a certain period of time sure Sure. I just said I just sat with officials and I, I had to bring them kind of back to reality and say, you know, Jennifer isn't an object. She's turned into an object mm -hmm. over time. She's not an object. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about, you know, we're talking about someone who breathes, who cries, who laughs, who sings, who screams, you know, who bleeds, you know, I just think, I mean, think, but going, you know, going back to the regional centers, it is, it is very, it's, it's incredibly important. Think of what we do anyhow. And who I believe should do it is the U.S. Marshals. The U.S. Marshals have been finding people left and right, and they're really good at it. I don't know if it's because of the databases they have or, or just the people that, that are there. It's their skill set. They're, it's their skill yeah. set. I, I, we have a good friend of ours, Lenny DePaul, who's the commander of the U.S. Marshals in the New York City area. And he... They're phenomenal. Those yeah. guys, I mean, you know, he's a former Navy SEAL. They, they were so good and and when he was doing it and they continue to do that but yeah i think that's the i think that that's the right organization federal organization because that's yeah. all they do is find people right bad guys right. and they, yeah. they're great at doing that give them something else to find yeah and i don't understand why we don't do it. we waste so much money on so much other stuff it's just like please i know do it I know. I think that's the, the most maddening thing on these cases. But it cases. takes people, you know, awareness is, awareness is everything. I mean, look at the National Center. Look at NICMIC, right? The National Center for Missing and Endangered Children. What do they really do? I got to be honest with you. What do they really do? They're an information base. They get over $30 million a year from the federal government to be an information base. They're not out there finding people. We need feet on the ground out of that organization. Mm -hmm. If we're giving them $30 million, $30 million, well, why don't you throw a million or two towards people on the ground doing the hard stuff, teaching on the ground with law enforcement next to them and find people. Well, listen, even, even if law enforcement doesn't have the time or the resources to do it and, and, and then get resources from that organization, even if they do it, there's plenty of capable private investigators. Privatize sure. it. Get, get, allow them. Pay them to do it. You know why not? If the if the law enforcement doesn't have the bandwidth to handle it, mm -hmm. let's figure out a way to have other people looking out there. And there's a lot of private citizens who would do it too. Absolutely. I mean, there's so They're many people. For me. How how many They're times have, for Jennifer? <laughs> exactly. How many times have you had volunteers looking for Jennifer? How many times? At least twenty to thirty times. In our first two weeks, we had fourteen hundred people each Saturday going out to look for Jennifer. Yep, and Paula did too. Yeah. She, everything she organized, she had organizations like Volunteer, Equisurge from Texas, which they do side scan sonar, and mm -hmm. you know a lot of other organizations that have come out. And sure. there, there's people want to help. They just need yeah. to know 
how to and where to go. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of it, just like in Jennifer's case, a lot of it does come down to Jennifer lost in the first 24 hours. Mm-hmm. First reactions. It's first reactions. It, it, it does count. And missing person's case out of any other thing that I've ever known law enforcement-wise, criminal-wise, it counts. Yeah, very similar to Molly and Colt. I mean, they the sheriff declared these guys a runaway. Oh, they're out in Wichita Falls. Yeah. And he even told the news that, oh, they're runaways. Oh, he called the news and told the reporter straight off the bat, oh, yeah, these are just missing running kids. They're no, they're, there's nothing wrong here. And then his cousin was the one who was driving the car that there was they were last seen in. And he didn't go and check. And it was a chase. It was a chase. Yeah, I read that, yeah. And then he didn't even bother to go the next day to go see his cousin to find out what had happened in the chase because he had done this so many times before and gotten away with it because his cousin was the sheriff. Yeah. And so... And then he didn't get a formal statement from him until like... Three weeks later. Three to two (laughs) weeks later. I mean, even if... Regardless if that person was involved in disappearance or not, he was the last person to see them. And the fact that there was nobody looking for them in that period, and they knew exactly where the the chase had ended. So they knew where they were, and no one looked for them. It's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and people need to be brought to bear on that. Honestly, you do. Say, why did this happen? Why? And let's change it. Yeah. Can't change what happened, which can change going forward. Yeah. Because what happens then and what has happened since then, all of these wild ass theories come out. People start sure. pointing. Look at Jennifer people, too. Sure. Exactly. People start pointing fingers at people that may or may not have had anything to, to be involved with. And so mm-hmm. the investigation gets diluted from the get go because there's mm-hmm. no information. That's what, that's what you get for not doing things right the first time. It's a job. You know, it, law enforcement is a job. And there's functions to the job. And if you do your job and the functions properly, then you have the best chance of a, of a positive outcome. And then you can go back to a family or whatever situation and say, well, we did this, 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 and this the way we're supposed to, and we didn't get the results that we thought we would get. What else do we need to do? It doesn't work that way, though. Okay, we're not, you know, that's like corporate world if you don't produce you're gone well, it doesn't it doesn't work in law enforcement and, and government can't get rid of even in law enforcement and government you have to work with it and through it that's very yeah. very tough it's every it's, it's tough there's no two ways of getting around it it's bullshit what was your aha moment when you realized they're not going to help me i'm going to have to do this on my own at what point did you realize that when we had to go when we had to go after the files we were we were pounding i was pounding my head against the wall and it just dropped off there was like no responses anymore and it seems as if i was bothering them and at that point, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't have their attention anymore. So you kick it up. And, you, you, you know, you try to do what, you know, I was trying to work with them for years and years and years. Please, just let us have the information. I'll let you speak to my people. You can see that all their background and everything. I have a team of 13 that has over 500 years experience in law enforcement. So please, you don't want to do the work. You can't do the work or you don't want to pay for the work. I got, I, I have people that do. Let us do it. And it was a fight to have it happen. So we won that one, but we haven't won Jennifer yet. Yeah. You know, and we may never find Jay. You, you, you know, it, it, circumstances are circumstances. You have to live with what happened and you have to work through what happened. And there are things we just can't change, get back or do differently. And that has affected and will affect the outcome. Unfortunately, in Jennifer's case, and, and in, you know, it seems as this case here, just tough breaks. You know, just didn't, things didn't roll the right way as they should have. And uh, the families have to try and pick up the pieces now and do the right thing. We always keep you guys in our hearts and pray that you will get some mm-hmm. answers for this. Drew. We thank you. We're working hard and we think we will, even if it's to the point where, well, we have done everything and run down every damn last thing that we thought. One way or the other, we're just going to do what needs to be done for Jennifer. And we're getting, we're getting close. You know, if we get, we're moving the case, we will move the case. And we have a list of things to be done along with the evidence to be redone. But once we get past that, if we're just sitting here scratching our heads again, then, we'll, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for someone to fall upon her or DNA to pop up, you know, as it does in 34 year old cases. And we, we, we have to live with that. But we're going to do every damn thing we can first. <laughs> You're an inspiration, Drew. You and Joyce and your family, your tenacity is unmatched to anything that I've seen. Uh, Paula is probably, you know. Yeah, she reminds same. us of you a lot. Oh, my God. It's, it's very just similar. The conversations. And- it's necessary. I mean, obviously, you're not going to get yeah. answers unless you push. Do you think I want to do what I'm doing? No. I mean, honestly, I've lost everything. I know. It's 
I, I got nothing. I don't even want to go in to tell you what I've really lost. But no, we know. No, we know. I sit. I sit here, and it's all for Jennifer, and I don't care because she's my daughter, and I, like I said, every day of my life, I, I, she was created from love. How can I walk away? I can't walk away from her. Period. Drew, we really appreciate you talking to us. I think it's super important yeah. to people and to understand this. And Jennifer's case is still out there, and anybody out there who's who wants to look into more about this case, there's so much online. You know, we did a an episode of, of an Oxygen for Up and Vanished on it, and there's so much information out there. And I just, Cindy and I can't. We we think the the world of you. Drew and your family and the fact that you've done so much for missing persons in the state of Florida. I think everybody really needs to look at what you guys have done and replicate it because it's working. Mm -hmm. It's obviously it's working. Yeah. Well, yeah, (laughs) it's what you're forced to do that, you know, exactly. But, um, yeah, but thank you for you. You know, if, if people don't have the space to say it and show it, nobody knows about it either. So, you know, thank you for what you give to people the opportunity to do. Well, so. please say hello to Joyce and to yes, and your, your son and his family and everyone. And um, yep. hopefully we'll see you when we're in Florida next time. Yeah, very good. Okay. Be, All safe, right. be well. All right. Take All care. Right. Stay Drew. safe in the hurricane. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Next time on Partners in True Crime. Our investigation into the case of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes continues. We're going to be sorting through tips and we are going to be speaking to new experts in law enforcement and the legal field from around the country who will hopefully help us unravel this mystery. If you or anyone you know is suffering from a methamphetamine addiction, please contact the American Meth Addiction Hotline. If you or anyone you know has been the victim of sexual abuse, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. For any tips relating to the disappearance of Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, please contact 833-4-MOLLY and COLT and they will be directed to the proper law enforcement agency. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content. Please visit our website where you can subscribe to the podcast, find show notes, and listen to Vi's original song, Take Me Back, written for Molly Miller.